We've got three of the finest uh, writers to have come out of uh, Sri Lanka for a very, very long time. Uh, there, of course, work speaks for itself. Uh, there's, of course, uh, the absolutely incredible uh, Ramesh Gunasekara uh, with uh, his fantastic reef. If you haven't read this, uh, this was, of course, shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize as well. Uh, there's um, Jimmy Tendufla, whose uh, nomadic style of writing and living has uh, been an inspiration for those who followed him. And there's, of course, uh, the absolutely wonderful uh, Ashok Ferry as well. So um, may I uh, please call uh, the three uh, Sri Lankan uh, craftsmen of the world uh, to stage, please. Mr. Ramesh Gunasekara, Mr. Ashok Ferry, and uh, Mr. Jimmy Tendufla. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, I thought, uh, what would be a cool, cool way to, um, to begin? And I thought uh, we're living in a dystopian time. <laughs> we are also living in a city that looks like it's, uh, uh, it can be set in any of uh, Orwell's novels. <laughs> so I thought uh, uh, we'd start with the, uh, there was an 80, 81 song by Bob Dylan, uh, who himself now is a Nobel laureate. Uh, he said, uh, broken cutters, broken saws, broken buckles, broken laws, broken bodies, broken bones, broken voices on broken phones. Take a deep breath, feel like you're choking. Everything is broken. <laughs> and, um, that I thought... Uh, That's a nice optimistic note to start <laughs> <laughs> I thought we'd start right at the bottom so that <laughs> the only way to go is up. <laughs> uh, especially in a city that uh, is... Uh, actually making us feel like we're choking, but uh, uh, the fact that, uh, th that we're living in such times uh, needs hope, and uh, hope is what we have when we uh, read the words that all three of you have crafted so beautifully into, uh, into, uh, into sentences that have made us shake our heads, uh, especially um, uh, when I read Reef, uh, Vijetunga's uh, uh, description about uh, he looked very uncomfortable and always looked like he was choking on his thoughts <laughs> was uh, was quite the uh, uh, quite the eye opener because uh, you know you have thoughts in your heads but uh, it's about the expression of that thought and the one thought that I've got in my head right now is that of identity because uh, on this stage there are three people who sort of uh, define what a global identity could be uh, Chibi of course has. Uh, that lush family tree uh, which had uh, uh, fearsome warlords as well, I'm told, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and an educator par excellence as well. Uh, identity right now is becoming, becoming a very, very, um, a very, very strong motif across uh, everything that we do and arts is un also not untouched by it. Uh, so Chimi, uh, you think uh, identity plays a part in, uh, in what you write? Well, um, it does, in fact, it's when, when you introduced us as, um, luckily we're not in Sri Lanka, so when you said the three f uh, finest writers, you've got two finest writers and me. If you, <laughs> if, if, you, if you said that in Sri Lanka, you would have been deported, probably. Um, so, but yeah, for me, I'm, I'm a, because I'm a foreigner, but I li who lives in Sri Lanka, I've been there for a long time, so I see myself as, a, as a, I, I feel that I can observe things in ways which other people might take for granted. I don't know if I get it down on paper well, but sort of things can surprise me. And so my identity within that mm -hmm. sort of just makes, makes it easier for me to write, certainly. Um, Ashok, you agree? Uh, identity makes it a little easier for you to write? Uh, being rooted in a, in a particular identity? I mean, is it a cop-out that we, we, we always like to be outsiders looking? Do all writers have to be like this? I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it's certainly much easier for us to write observing and we always have that excuse if people don't like what we write we say oh we're the outsider we, we see it in a different way <laughs> so perhaps it's, it's kind of an excuse I don't know <laughs> um, what also um, I think uh, Reef did to me uh, Mr. Gunasekara of course was uh, the fact that uh, uh, it gave me uh, the um, uh, the explanation of uh, uh, that phenomenon of uh, willing suspension of disbelief uh, as uh, being something that's uh, a little removed from something that we learn in English class because uh, the whole uh, normalization of, uh, of conflict where um, the everyday tone of what you were saying uh, belied the, uh, the heaviness of the events that were happening uh, during Reef. Uh, so conflict as, uh, as a motif to writing uh, how important has that been uh, in the way that you uh, conceive what you write? Gosh, we're moving so fast from identity <laughs> to conflict. <laughs> I'm still catching up on the identity <laughs> one. Um, on the conflict, and I'm, I never set out to write about conflict, I'm, perhaps I don't, other than conflict that you have in any personal situation. Mm -hmm. 
I guess the difference for me was that at the time that my first things were being published happened to coincide with a time when um, things started happening in Sri Lanka. And mm -hmm. I had some stories that were set there. And therefore, basically 1983, and therefore it had to s sort of, my fiction, I felt, had to negotiate a reality that was changing in mm -hmm. uncomfortable ways. Sure. Uh, and that's, I suppose, the reason why what I write engages with that. But the identity question, I think, is really, really interesting as well, because it has become hugely important. But we don't always know what we mean by identity and what makes us what we are. And that's partly one of the reasons why a lot of writers write. And uh, I spent some of my formative years in the Philippines, um, growing up in the Philippines. And I set one book in the Philippines, a book called The Match which is my cricket novel, which uh, was written a little bit before the Vogue for cricket novels started. <laughs> um, and um, that was set in the Philippines and uh, really around about the 1960s in the Philippines. Now, the 1960s in the Philippines is a, is a period that most living Filipinos have no memory of because they weren't alive, because it's actually a very young population. Sure. Um, but I remember s discussions in Manila when I went uh, with the book there and talk, talk about it and so on. And one of the big questions I remember one of the newspapers had was saying that, you know, this was a really interesting um, portrayal, if you like, of, the, of Manila in the 1960s. And the question was, do you have to be a Filipino to be a Filipino? Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's some truth to that. In, in a sense, what you write is partly what you are and what people are are partly what they read. Um, so that in due course, as our audience here read our books, they will all become Sri Lankan. Of course, of course. Uh, which, which is also a, a, a bit of a dichotomy in my head because uh, we become more globalized. But yes. uh, uh, in a sense, uh, the world is also becoming uh, uh, more and more insular where uh, uh, individual parochial identities, um, uh, state definitions, uh, language barriers, etc., are being up becoming uh, uh, more aggressive topics of discussion in that way. Um, as a writer, does that become a little difficult to deal with this dichotomy uh, towards the changing audiences? No, no, no. Please, please go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I think Ashok, my phone off. Ashok, Ashok <laughs> hasn't answered many, um, hasn't spoken much, yeah. and also, there's you use too many big words for me. Yeah, repeat the question <laughs> again. The big words. Repeat the question again. The, 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 uh, repeat the question. <laughs> Essentially, the fact that uh, everyone's saying that, oh, I belong to this country, but we'll read everything from every other place, but we'll still be very strongly uh, identifying uh, more and more with uh, with who they are in the geographical sense is what I'm asking. Does that does that in any way uh, affect the way you write or for who you write for, considering audiences are important? It's it's a great temptation, a great temptation to let it affect you, but it mustn't. You you have. Mm -hmm. to, um, I was just thinking when you were talking earlier, Ramesh, about uh, the Philippines. Now I grew up in 1960s Somalia, Mogadishu, and we were just saying that, wow. that the Mogadishu I knew does not exist anymore. It is a That's beautiful right. place, very civilized, more sophisticated than the Colombo of the 1960s that I'd gone from. But yet, if I wrote that, nobody would believe me because. <laughs> The idea that people have a Mogadishu now is bombs and wrecks, mm. wreckage, and sure, etc. Sure. So, so whose is the real reality? Your Philippines of the 1960s or the young Filipinos today? Uh, but it leads you to this thing that that all of us, because we're so mixed up, originally, 20, 30 years ago, we were kind of ashamed of this. You know, you there was almost a sort of moral obligation to belong to different, a particular tribe, a, a particular place, a particular time. Sure. That doesn't seem to exist anymore. But because it doesn't exist, there is this yearning of everyone to belong to tribes again. So sure. that, that, that's your question. You're, of course. No. Uh, I, as you said, uh, the, the whole idea of uh, being rooted in identity, the changing world, etc. Uh, 
again, we, we see that in India, the, the whole 1947, 1982, uh, all of those points are now actually, um, uh, you know, th there's that whole discussion about it being irrelevant to a whole new generation. But conflict and its, um, uh, uh, its ramifications are still very fresh uh, as far as Sri Lanka is concerned. Uh, uh, would you agree? Uh, do you think that, uh, that there is a generation to whom uh, what happened uh, through the decades in Sri Lanka has become irrelevant? Well, I, I work at a school, and certainly the young, the students there are not that aware. I mean, they're aware of the history, but it wouldn't be. You could, you could, they could read a novel about Sri Lanka without it being in there. Sure. Whereas maybe for foreign readers, they kind of seem to expect it to be in there. And mm -hmm. I, I don't, that, that's my view. I'm not sure, but um, that I think I think because Ashok was saying in one of yeah. your books, they were asking where the conflict was in your. Uh, also, I think, Mr. Gunasekra, you started writing uh, when that conflict was actually, um, I think, uh, uh, in its um, uh, uh, most virulent form, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, you'd begun to write uh, Monkfish Moon in 90, 90, 1991, I think. And uh, that was a time when, when Sri Lanka had actually hit the headlines with the kind of stuff that was happening. And now uh, th uh, there's a sea change. Uh, how have you seen that change in your readership as well? Have you been, uh, uh, have you seen a change in the audiences that you get for your books? Um, I think Ashok is right. It's very difficult to get a get a sense of um, who you're writing for, audiences, that sort of thing. It doesn't really impinge. I mean, I uh, when I started writing, I I came from um, an understanding of the world that nobody probably would read what you write. So my expectations <laughs> were very, very low. <laughs> right. Um, my expectations are not much higher now. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there's a mythology, you know, it's easy to think that there are loads of people reading what you write, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, in my case, I mean, I, I did find that there, I did have some readers, and I was very grateful for that. I'm still very grateful for that. Um, but it's, the inge involvement with, with reading is, is, is it's, it's actually a, a very strange world we enter. It's a minority of the world that reads. Right. A minority of, the, of that minority that reads fiction <laughs> and enjoys fiction. And, you know, you, you work in a, in a completely strange world. So sometimes, even with Reef, for example, which, um, which, as you say, was written at a time when there was a lot of trouble in Sri Lanka's image in the world, if you like, was uh, very bloodstained. Um, and in many ways, it's quite a sad book. But the initial responses I had in those pre-internet days when people wrote to you letters, <laughs> yes. and I discovered I had at least one reader because somebody wrote to me. Oh. And they wrote to me and said how they loved reading this book because when they were reading it on the bus, they couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> and oh, I thought, what's okay. this? Um, and then I realized that actually, in some respects, it's quite a comic novel, and there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of jokes in it, which <laughs> I didn't think anybody would ever get. Right. I thought they were my private jokes, but I realized if you read fiction, you'll get it, because it's jokes with the language. Sure. Uh, there's a lot of fun in it, and. I discovered that people can get that. So you do build up some sort of relationship. Yeah. I, I had this kind of strange thing that my one book that deals with the war, Serendipity, was written in the last three months of the war. Sure. Uh, and it is easily the funniest book. Uh, but the humor is quite shrill and quite hysterical, but it is humorous nonetheless. Sure. So I, I maybe it's, it's our Sri Lankan reaction to all these huge things going on around us. But I feel that yeah, because we, we had so long of the war, it became so normalized, to me at least, and there was humor about life then. And then we had this attack more recently, and we weren't really prepared for that. And we, we, everyone panicked massively. It was a completely different shift, whereas sure. um, back in the day it was kind of accepted. And then the army came back on the road, and everyone was um, quite on edge about it. But at the time, I, I don't know, I certainly found out during the war it was very normal. So when, if I had written then, I would have written maybe differently to how I write now. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also, uh, at least in India, there's a uh, there's a, a very vibrant scene currently where a lot of people are writing, a lot of people are being published. Uh, considering that uh, you started writing when uh, uh, when it was probably um, 
decidedly harder to uh, uh, to get your book across and to and get people interested in it. Uh, have you seen a, a bit of an uptick in the kind of people who are taking up writing in Sri Lanka, especially? Do you see a new generation of writing writers coming up, uh, sort of taking up the new wave? Is that happening in Sri Lanka? Uh, Jimmy, considering that uh, you're the one who's actually building the next generation with that school, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, so I'll like, lay that burden squarely on your shoulders. Well, actually, I, I mean, I don't know if new writers have come through, but certainly I was just telling Ashok yesterday, out of my own students, their writing standards have um, improved drastically recently, and quite a lot of them are talking about becoming writers. Mm -hmm. They don't realize I have to break the bu uh, burst the bubble for them about making a living from writing. Maybe <laughs> 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 So when, when they, then I tell them what I am from writing, and they say, actually, maybe I won't. <laughs> uh, Ashok, is uh, um, making... I, I think Chim is right. I think that we are on, sort of, we're waiting for this new generation to come up. Um, what's happened at the moment is we have this very kind of disastrous uh, language policies in the 60s. You know, Sinhala only. English was considered the pariah language. You were kind of a traitor if you spoke it, wrote it. I see. When, when we organized the first Gaul Literary Festival, I would get calls at about 11 o'clock at night saying, you're a traitor. Why are you uh, promoting an English language festival in Sri Lanka? Wow. So we had that kind of ethos. Um, or, or added to that is the fact that there are very few English teachers in Sri Lanka currently who can speak English. Oh, I see. Do you know, it's, it's very, there's a real dearth of, of, of English and, uh, teachers of English. So the poor kids are desperate to learn English, but they can't get that at school, and they, they all enroll at the British Council or wherever, uh, and it's not enough. They, they, they need to do more. But we're slowly coming out of that now, because with international schools, like, like, like Trimmy School, the Moya School, you know, there, there, there are more kids learning English. So hopefully we will have more teachers, and therefore you will sort of sure. breed more, more writers. It, I, I, I have a, maybe it's, I don't know, uh, delusionally slightly more optimistic view, um, partly because when I went to school in the 1950s, I had an English teacher in Colombo who couldn't speak English oh. either. Oh, oh, really? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> so, uh, that's point one. But more, I mean, because I suppose my books, I started writing, as you were saying, in the 90s. So over that long, long period, I certainly have seen, I think, what I would call a flowering of writing. It may be in a bit of a hiatus now at the moment, but I know when Monkfish Moon came out, I think there was hard, people were hardly ever discussing fiction, certainly fiction by anyone with a Sri Lankan connection. I do remember the newspaper sort of in Colombo, there was one small item said, uh, you know, Ramesh Gunasekra has written a book and that's about it. And two, <laughs> two, who is this? And two paragraphs about it or something like that. But partly, partly I think the Gaul Festival did a lot, uh, a literary festival Absolutely. there, in introducing the idea, normalizing writing a little sure. bit, but also making it quite, quite trendy and fashionable, um, that you did have people who wanted to become writers and starting to read and to discuss books. And a wide range of books, not just local books, not just foreign books, but a mixture. And um, over the years, I've run a few workshops uh, in Sri Lanka, and it was just interesting that the range of people who came to those, they were not of any one particular class. Um, and also because there are a lot of Sri Lankans or people connected with Sri Lanka outside Sri Lanka, there are a lot of those voices coming through. And I, I get sent books now practically every other month of a Sri Lankan writing, published a new book in some country or the other. Uh, and it's not always about the war. It's sure. lots of different things, and that's very healthy. And then, of course, there was the Man Booker um, uh, nomination as well, and uh, there's a bit of a controversy there as well, wasn't there, um, uh, about Reef? You, you remember any of that? Controversy? Yeah. You mean that I didn't get it? Tell me more. What do you mean? <laughs> I, I don't remember. Uh, no. Uh, uh, there was that. Uh, there was the whole thing about uh, uh, you know subcontinental writing uh, catching up, but uh, still not getting its due. The uh, well, yeah, rumblings. It, I mean, that was a long <laughs> because uh, that was in 1994, and at yeah. that point, I think uh, I was probably only the second Asian writer. The second who, Asian, yes. Uh, to I have been nominated. I think maybe Rohinton Mystery had before. Was probably. Rohinton. Only one, and then, uh, of course, Michael Ondaatje had won the book. Uh, of course, um, but uh, but you know that 
prices change. Um, and uh, you know, it's a good thing that people discuss books as a result of it. I, and that's what I wanted to ask. Did that uh, uh, Man Booker nomination do anything uh, uh, to Sri Lankan writing uh, in English? Uh, was there an impact? Was there uh, an uptake? Was there anything at all that was noticed after the fact that uh, someone from uh, within, within us had, uh, had gotten there because uh, these prizes seem to be um, uh, sort of medals of honor that uh, uh, that everyone needs to flaunt, and uh, subsequently, there's uh, of course, uh, you know, you do tend to see a a little bit of a, uh, more of an interest. Did that happen in Sri Lanka? Well, I, I well, I, the first book had two paragraphs, but when Reef came out, it had lots of <laughs> lots of newspaper coverage. It, it, it did, um, yeah, and I, I got a lot of supporting letters and things from people there, and. Certainly when I started going back and launching books there, there was a lot more interest. And a lot more younger people, I think, did, mm -hmm. did start thinking about sure. you know, this mistaken idea that you might be able to become a writer and make a living out of it, which <laughs> is a mistaken idea. But at least yeah. it's a good thing for people to have that besides wanting to be a doctor or an engineer. Well, doctor, I think they should, but <laughs> lots of other things <laughs> that they don't need to. And as you said, uh, English, as far as its teaching is concerned, as far as its uh, uh, adoption in, in Sri Lanka is concerned, is a little bit of a fraught a topic. But uh, what about vernacular literature? Is, uh, do you think, uh, we, because here we have, uh, we've had vernacular superstars. There are people uh, in, uh, writing in Bengali, writing in Tamil. Uh, do you have, and, and considering Sri Lanka does have uh, two very strong languages, singular and, uh, and Tamil are, are languages rooted in tradition and in beauty as well. Uh, are there uh, um, are there writers who are uh, uh, well known in in the vernacular space as well, Sri Lanka? Y yes, there are. I mean, uh, very well known writers. One of the problems we have is that that um, uh, we don't have the critical mass of any one readership that India has. Right. So even if you write in, uh, I don't know, um, think of a fairly obscure Indian language, still there's. Sure. Uh, 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 physically Leadership. a mass of writers uh, reach. We, we don't really have that. Uh, having said that, there are lots of, I mean, I, I would say that the, the vernacular scene is much more buzzy than the English writing scene. That's the impression I get. Do they have publishers for it? I mean, are the publishers? Yes, I, sorry, I ma 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 many more, right. many more, and there are big prizes and so on. Oh, I see. Um, I interestingly, uh, no, I'm, no, I, I can't qualify that. There are many more. Especially, for example, in the Gaul Literature Festival. I mean, uh, did you see a lot of interest from the vernaculars as well? Because there's that whole thing about literature festivals and English and, you know, the cultural uh, 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 undertones that begin to uh, emerge when you do something like that. Yeah, very sadly, we still have that and we're trying desperately to overcome that. And it might be another 20, 30 years before Sri Lankans get, get their head around the fact that, that, that these various languages aren't the enemy, that we're all in it sure. together, do you know? Sure. But, but sadly it exists, I mean, one has to be realistic, and so, so the Gaul Festival has this idea of being sort of elitist or whatever, it isn't, you know, um, the, the many of the people who go, um, most of the people who go there are not elitist, sure. uh, but, but it's expensive and, and one has to work harder to get more sponsorship, etc. Uh, language also tends to grow despite the education, right? I mean, uh, there are the young people who develop their own ways of expression, which is also what is happening uh, here in the Indian scene, which is that uh, there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, confidence in writing the way you speak, and, uh, and uh, the, uh, the traditional mores and norms can be actually thrown to the wind, and there are people who are consuming that language, there are people who are writing in that language as well, and in that way, it's sort of flourishing as a, as a character of its own. Is that also happening in Sri Lanka this uh I think I think that is actually pretty universal and being a radio person you, you might appreciate but I remember someone telling me a long time ago like in the 70s how really since about 1950 when popular music took to the airwaves the the main cultural tradition that everybody in the world kind of subscribes to or has is the, is the music scene that comes from the radio. Sure. That actually people have grown up wherever they are, whether it's Mogadishu or Colombo or wherever, um, the songs in your head actually are pretty global and has been since about 1950. Right. Uh, and that kind of does inform a lot of things that we do. But, but I, I, I would say that, I, mean, I, I think, I'm, I'm sort of on thin ice here, but I, but I think 
still in certainly in the Sinhala world of, of letters, uh, you are somewhat vilified if you try and bring that language into modern day. Um, I know my friend Sunetra Rajakarunayaka who, who does write like that and she's best-selling author at home. Um, um, she, she gets a lot of flack from academia, from other writers who say, this is not how you should write. Singhala has this very beautiful, courtly, flowery language, use it. But the trouble is that that language, as time goes on, gets more and more distant from everyday the speech. Spoke. Yeah, um, in fact, that's the thing. Uh, the importance of slang is uh, yeah. because slang is uh, is something that sort of is your is your gateway to more uh, 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 experimentation or uh, uh, with reading more. Is that uh, something that's developing in Sri Lanka? Does it have its own slang? Yeah, absolutely. That the but but it's all in the spoken word, never in the written. I don't know what it's like in India. What is your news like? Is it very flowery? Is it very courtly? Or or is it more? <laughs> In in uh, sort of what people speak. I think brutal. Uh, I, think, uh, <laughs> I think the <laughs> the that's that's the real thin ice that we're treading on about yeah, yeah, about yeah. what but news no, is. Because because in, in in Sri Lanka the, the the Singhala. I mean my Singhala is okay. I can build houses in Singhala, but 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 to write books in Singhala is, is quite difficult for me. Right. You know, uh, but to listen to the news, it's it's that very courtly language, lots of real Sanskrit words, and and it's really quite difficult to 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 to, to get. You get the sense of it, but the precise meaning is quite difficult. So in other words, th that language is, is quite removed from everyday speech. So I think across the board, uh, Jimmy, you've been awfully quiet about this. I, I have a feeling I, you're I, trying I to avoid. I can't, <laughs> but I, I can't actually speak much about when I say much, hardly any. But my wife is um, Sri Lankan and she can't understand the news, for example. So there's different ways of... Maybe they don't want us to understand the news. <laughs> but in the school that you run, is there a, a development of an English slang that happens that also incorporates well, local words, etc.? Well, um, is, is that something that's developing? I, I guess so, but I mean, it's probably quite Western influence, but, um, but they are experimenting. So when you mentioned that earlier, because I, I actually am, um, one of my main roles is doing university applications, so they have to write the essays for American un universities. Right. And I tell them, please experiment, please be different. And then sometimes I get these essays where I say, actually, that's too good. <laughs> 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 so now I'm, I'm chucking my book away because they are really experimenting and coming up with really quite fascinating ways of expressing themselves. Sure. And it's a risk because then you don't know whether they're, they're, they're going to be understood when it goes there. But, but I, I think it's worth taking the risk because they've got to stand out to get into Harvard or something like that. So. Sure, sure. Uh, there's also um, this thing about, uh, you know, the globalized aud audiences that we were talking about earlier as well. There's also this uh, whole thing about the attention spans actually shrinking, um, uh, the question marks about long form. Uh, has that uh, affected your writing in any way? Have you tried to adapt to that in any way? Uh, both of you, of course, have, uh, have written short stories uh, uh, and collections called Petty People, of course. Um, uh, but uh, Mr. Guna Sekra, uh, your, your form of expression uh, needs to breathe. Uh, well, I started with short stories. My first book was a collection of, of stories. My last book was also a collection of stories. Um, but I do write novels. Um, do I cater to that? I mean, they're very, very short sentences, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're not difficult <laughs> at all. And in fact, this latest book uh, is set in the 60s when the language issue was the big political thing. Mm -hmm. and you know, the, the main characters are two young boys, but their parents are grappling with the fact that the, the official language is about to change. And uh, if you couldn't pass your exams, even if you were, you know, a 48-year-old civil servant, if you couldn't pass your new single exams, you'll be out of a job. Um, okay. And it was serious. And wow. lots of people were out of their sure. jobs. And they had to sit their exams like your kids at school, basically. And they had to go to school, a lot of these older men uh, and women who were working had to go to school to learn their single enough to pass their exam. Um, so, it, it, you know, it was, a, it was a big issue. But the long form, short form, well, I know it's often thought that young people have shorter attention spans. I'm not sure that's true at all. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you have obviously the obvious examples like Harry Potter. Of Massive books that these young kids were reading, sure. uh, or Philip Pullman's books, which are again very complex and Absolutely. very very big, um, and you know they get into those in a big way. They get into, you know, Game of Thrones and all these stuff, which is they're complex narratives that 
take a lot of attention one way or the other. Sure. So I don't, I don't go with the idea that attention spans are getting sure. shorter. Uh, I mean, they might be getting longer. You've, of course, had to, uh, I'm sure you get to interact with a lot of audiences um, across the world uh, uh, with your travels, etc. Um, uh, you certainly, uh, you agree that there is hope as far as, uh, as the long form is concerned. Oh, yes, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> sure. I mean, I think, you know, the, the technology will change, whether it always will be with paper and, and so on, I don't know. Uh -huh. um, but long narratives is what we live with. I mean... Yeah. We need it. We need it the same way we need food. Sure. You know, it just we need it for our brains. Uh, you agree, Shok? Yes. And uh, sorry, you can yeah, answer. definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I think I think it is here to stay. What whatever yeah. people say. And famous uh, last words. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy, you uh, uh, you have thoughts about long form, short form? Um, well, actually, I, I prefer writing short stories. Exactly. But, um, yeah. But but yeah, I mean, but when when you write short stories, you see it, well at least for from what I've learned, that they're much harder to sell a collection than a novel, so they're right. a bigger market for novels as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were talking about audiences. Uh, there was a very interesting conversation that I had with this band called Strings. Um, iconic band uh, from Pakistan, they did their, um, uh, they were one of the first people to actually start singing in Urdu and incorporate elements of rock. And uh, I asked them about audiences and uh, they had something very interesting to say because they started in the early 90s as well. They said when they started, um, Everything that they had to do to, uh, uh, to get their music noticed was the push medium. That there were only uh, three ways that you could do it, radio, television, and, uh, and print. And you had to actually push your music out to them so that people would get to know. Now, and this was because they, were, they had just launched their new album uh, about 20 years after they had sort of first launched their album. They said, now it's become a pull medium. That there are so many ways to reach the audience that you have to literally try and pull them in. And um, to me, that was uh, that was a fascinating, fascinating thought as far as uh, getting your art noticed was uh, was concerned. Uh, have you have you ever noticed that? That uh, did you have to push your book out when you started uh, Monkfish Moon? Uh, did you ever think of that, uh, Mr. Gonsekra? Did I have to did I have to push my book? I, well, <laughs> I mean, the big the difficulty with writing is writing the book, really, um, and you really can't think of anything else besides getting. The book, getting the words in the right place, getting the book to work the way you want it to do. Uh, and as we were saying a little earlier, if you're a writer, unfortunately, you never know whether you've done it right or wrong. Your musician friends are in a very <laughs> good position because when they play the wrong chord or play the wrong note, they can hear it and they know they've done it wrong. Uh, when you're a writer, you can't tell. Um, you can't ever, ever tell. Um, so you just do your best and hope for the best, really. <laughs> and pushing and pulling, I have no idea. Yeah, there are loads of ways of getting to people. Um, you, know, you can do all your Instagrams and you can do all your social media, but most of your social media are for people who like social media. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to read a book. Sure. Um, so the people who are going to read the book, you know, I think we are very lucky because three of us here, for example, we can see people here. Um, at least some of you I know must be reading books. That's where you're here. <laughs> Whereas, you know, a hundred years ago, if you were a writer, you hadn't, you know, you didn't have that chance. You wrote exactly. your book and you... Hoped for the best. It. <laughs> you didn't even hope for the best. I mean, you didn't know what happened. It was a one-way conversation. Sure. Um, Ashok, you f do you ever feel the need to call attention to your, um, uh, to your work a little more now than you did when you started? To, 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 to what? To, call, uh, to get people to know, uh, um, to, to know your work in a sense, because um, you know, there's just so much out there now. Yeah, but, but books are a real sort of solitary thing. It's you and your reader. It's a one-on-one -on -one thing. So if, if you are unlucky enough that your book doesn't have resonance many people, no amount of pushing is going to help. That's the thing. Sure. So you can have this huge media circus when a book comes out, for want of a better word. I'm not trying to diss it because I think it, it, it's necessary, it's, it's valuable, etc. Absolutely. It, it's part of, the for sure. part of the thing. But it will die down very quickly if 
two, three, five, ten, twenty people read that book and they have to put it down after page twenty and they struggle and then they put it away. You know, so it is a very solitary thing. So, so all I'm saying is, if you're lucky enough that your book has a certain resonance, it's like an underground fire. It'll catch anyway, as long as you strike that first match and put it out there. Sure. Do you know, I, I genuinely do feel this. You know, so much of modern day art, and by art I mean the, the whole range. The spectrum. Uh, the, 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 the marketing of art is so much is manipulated at the moment. Uh, and particularly in, in, in fine art, or what we call sort of, you know, painting or installation art or whatever, um, as opposed to literature, uh, it, 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 you know, you, everybody discovers a Da Vinci or a Botticelli, and then six months later, nobody's ever heard of him, and he's gone. Do you know? So it is manipulated. But with books, I don't think you can really do that. You, uh, I mean, you sure. can on, on a, a little bit, but beyond that, there has to be some genuine meat in that book that feeds, some, uh, feeds a particular writer. It's very interesting that you say that because there's actually a whole uh, subgenre right now which is the 15 minute read, uh, which is that you write and then you get it out for three months and then three months later you write another book and, uh, and, and the quantity sort of trumps the quality a little if, um, I mean, uh, of course this is a horrible generalization but uh, for want of uh, explaining, trying to explain it better, there's that whole um, instant gratification thing as well uh, and, and seems to be, it seems to be catching on with the hashtags. I, I am so against that you cannot believe. Yeah? yeah? Well, so, yeah, no, I was just, just going to say if you want to know whether Ashok Ferry uses social media much, just have a look at his telephone. <laughs> <laughs> The one I just, the the one I just put off. Yeah, yeah. I just yeah. had to put it off because so. I was so afraid my, my builder will call from Candy <laughs> in, the of, in the middle of this session. But I, I think it's, it's a pretty open area, I think. People write for lots of different reasons. People read for lots of different reasons. Um, and I don't see necessarily a hierarchy in there. Uh, I write a certain kind of book. I mean, I, I like to write books which I hope 20 years later someone can pick up and it'll still feel fresh enough to read or even longer than that. Um, but I also can have a lot of fun with very ephemeral writing. And I know a lot of younger writers who are very much into the sorts of things you're doing. And it's a huge amount of fun. And you're not doing it to create stuff to be read, you're doing it actually as part of your performance art, as part of a kind of expression. And I've done that as well a couple of years ago. Uh, I can't even remember, maybe three years ago, I can't remember. We had this project where we thought we'll, um, a group of us were going to write a book and publish it and launch it within 24 hours. And uh, okay. we set it up and we didn't quite hit the target. We wrote it and published it within 24 hours, but the launch was the next day. But it was a project where we had, I can't remember, I think it was 24 writers or 25 writers in uh, five countries, five continents, all online for 24 hours, oh, well, for 12 of those 24 hours, <laughs> writing the same story, adding to it, uh, it was great fun. I enjoyed it. Um, you know, I wrote a paragraph. Another 25 people wrote another paragraph. It's probably a story that nobody can make any sense of at all. But it was huge fun for all of us and for everyone involved um, on the internet at the time because people could chip in things saying, you know, why don't we have this character do this? So it, was, it was like a game. Sure. But it was fun. But, you know, I don't expect anyone to go and buy that book to read it. Which leads me to the... <laughs> Uh, yeah, right, right. This, this book this, I read it. that's yeah, different, yeah. you know, that took five years to write and, you know, a lot of thought went into it and everything else. And that's the thing about purpose, isn't it? I mean, uh, uh, does purpose play a lot of part in, uh, in the way you write? I mean, is there a purpose to, uh, uh, to uh, when you start writing? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a difficult one to answer. <laughs> There's I'm going to throw that to you. No, no, there's there's, there's a, a lovely thing I read or heard, I think read, that uh, the playwright Tom Stoppard said, that, which was that for many, many years he wrote because he wanted to be a writer. For years he would sit down and try to write because he wanted to be a writer. And then suddenly he 
time had passed and he realized he woke up and he was writing because he had become a writer. <laughs> so that's what you do. So that's the, the purpose is I, I just think uh, the only purposeful activity I do is writing. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ashok, you seem to be thinking. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a really difficult question. Um, but I, I think you, in many ways, you mustn't have a purpose when you write. Because it, it's, it's, if you take it to the parallel of building, you must always try and build a house from the inside out, not the outside in. You know, it's the same thing with writing. I can't sit here and say, I'm going to write the definitive book on the war, the 30-year war. It doesn't work like that. If it's not inside you, and if it doesn't come out organically or whatever, it won't really be a success. I, I, I don't know. What do you think, Jimmy? Is that, well, is that um, valid? I'm, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. I mean, I, I, I genuinely write just because I really enjoy it. And, and, I, and as you are saying before, I, I never expected anyone to read it. I didn't really want anyone to read it because I didn't really want to... I didn't think anyone would think it was as good as I thought it was, and, and I was right. But, um, <laughs> but it was just the enjoyment of it. And I, and I was too impatient. And it actually educational for me to be sitting with these guys also. Like, so, so you've taken five years over that book and I knew I was, I'm always too impatient to get a book out, whereas now I've grown up a bit and I'm actually um, enjoying the process more and again, finding, finding what, I'm, what, what is inside, I guess, because I start a lot and stop thinking, okay, that's, that's not actually what I should be writing. Sure. Uh, when I'd started writing uh, journalistically, uh, so to speak, there was a teacher who told us uh, one simple test. He said, if you're planning to put something out there, there is a test that you put, and uh, that test is called the who cares test. Uh, just uh, when you write, write what you want to write, and then ask yourselves, uh, who cares? And if you get any kind of an answer is when you go ahead and start writing. Um, does that ever... Uh, uh, that, could, that could be devastating, I think, <laughs> really. Because too dangerous, <laughs> too dangerous. Too dangerous. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, again, there's different kinds of write, writing. And I think probably here, all of us are sort of exploratory writers. We, we, we write to find out rather than, um, rather than to a purpose. But there's another kind of writer. So George Orwell would be the prime example who always said, you know, he wouldn't pick up his pen unless he knew what he wanted to say. And then he would make sure he said that. Um, and that's very fine for that kind of writing. But I'm not sure that works very well for a different kind of fiction, the kind of fiction certainly that I write. Sure. Um, any last thoughts on that before we wrap up? <laughs> Gosh, that sounds like doom. Yeah. It's about to descend. I thought we start with doom and end with doom. <laughs> but um, uh, of course, um, we have many questions, and those questions will have many other things to be said, but there's old father time that needs to be respected. Uh, so um, Suncatcher is uh, Ramesh Gunasekara's new book. You might want to uh, check it out. Uh, Do get that. out there for you to buy. And uh, um, uh, if you'd like to speak to him, uh, we shall ask his convenience as well. But for now, um, Mr. Gunasekra, uh, Mr. You. Ray, and Mr. Tendufla, thank you very much uh, for this session. Thank you. And, thank you. and thank their you. books are also in the bookshop. <laughs> and they are here as well. So you might want to uh, have a conversation because conversations usually uh, trigger the desire to pick up a book and see what is on paper that has been said uh, in words. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And uh, it's been absolutely wonderful. And uh, all the very best for the new book. Uh, I'm thank really you looking very forward much. to catching it. Thank you very much. Uh, please, can we have a round of applause for Thank you. <laughs>